Well, in this video, we're going to look at the second mean value theorem for integrals. Sometimes people just call it the second mean value theorem, but I like to put on for integrals specifically. Uh, this is really inspired by my uh, the 12th video in the four year series where I stated this without proof and now I'm going back and proving it. Uh, a lot of the proof comes from the math stack exchange. So let's look at the uh, the theorem. So let's uh, and there's two parts here. One basically where G is decreasing and one where G is increasing. We'll look at decreasing first. So let F be integrable on A to B and let G be monotonically decreasing and positive for all, a, you know, for all X in AB. Then there exists an E in this interval AB such that this integral, these two integrals uh, are equal. Now, a semi-intuitive feel, which is not 100% accurate, <laughs> which I think of it like this, since G is uh, decreasing, um, so if we stick in A here, this it's going to be at its biggest point. So we put it in, in here. And then since this is at its biggest point, we lower this down to, so those two intervals equal. And now it's not a it's that's in my mind that's the intuitive field, but actually that's not a hundred percent accurate because it really depends upon you know how negative or how positive this is. But that's kind of my general way I explain it. Here's the proof. Let's let f of x equal the integral from a to x of f of x, and we said f was integrable. So then when we write it like this, that means this uh, cap F is, is continuous. Cap F is continuous on AB and thus bounded. And let's call the bound little m and big M. Now, here's a, a note. If G of A is equal to zero, so remember G is decreasing on this interval and always positive. So if it's zero at A, and it's monotonically decreasing but always positive, that means it's zero in the whole interval interval. And so it means that those, you know, it's trivially true. So it's zero and the statement is obviously true. And so we'll assume that G of A is positive and then decreases after that. So now proving statement I, which is this, becomes uh, proving this. Now it's not a hundred percent obvious why. So we have this piece which is here, and then we divide it by this. But remember, cap f is this uh, this integral. So now um, this integral it has its its lowest point is that, and its biggest point is that, and so it, it's a continuous function. So we can make this you know this piece anything we want so we can you know we can choose a number in a b such that it equals anything in between and so and so now if we you know if we multiply the g of a up to both sides then we've bounded this function we have something that's bigger and something that's littler so surely we can pick a number in a b call it e such that you know they're they're equal and, and so proving this is actually proving this. Um, so from the intermediate value theorem for continuous functions, and oh, here's the key word. If this holds, then there exists an E in AB such that F of E, you know, is equal to this part here. Now, which then proves I. So if this is true, then then we're done so really the point is we have to show this is true so the whole proof will boil down to this and then you know the g of a is a constant so if we multiply it up to both sides that the that proving star is actually equivalent to proving this and this is what we want to prove so since f is integrable, 
it is bounded. So let's call it the capital L. That's what it's bounded by. Uh, and since G is monotonic, it's integrable. Uh, then there exists a partition um, from A to B um, such that for any epsilon, we have this true, where W is the oscillation of G in those intervals. And, and, I'll, and I'll, we'll explain this, I have an illustration below. So what, what the oscillation is, we'll look at this definition first. So if you have any interval I, the oscillation is the maximum value in that interval and the smallest value in that interval, and that's the difference. Okay, that's the oscillation. So, and then this is just the, the you know, the difference between points here. And the, this sum, we can make it as small as possible because of this. And here, here's a graphical representation of what it is. So, if we look at the, the uh, interval from A to uh, X1, well, you know, clearly delta X is whatever that distance is. And the oscillation is, what's the biggest value in, in this interval? And what's the smallest? And it's that difference is what the oscillation is. Then you, then you might think, well, wait, a, how can we make that arbitrarily small? Well, remember, we just said there exists a partition such that this sum is really small. And so, it, you know, these differences can go really, really, really small. And then, you know, the oscillation is really small. And so we can make them arbitrarily small. Really, the trickiest point, the tricky point is if there's a jump, because, um, okay, so the oscillation, say, at a point at x4 is the biggest value minus the smallest value, but they're the same, so it's zero. So the oscillation at most points are zero at a point. But if we look at this point, how can we, how can we uh, make that arbitrarily small? Well, if we if we pick an x on this side and an x on this side and then make them go really really small so this you know the oscillation is that difference but we're taking at times a delta that is so small that it makes that piece really small so we can add up all these little oscillations times the delta between the partition points we can make it as small as possible Okay, so that's what that's where this comes from. So now let's look at the uh, I. We're going to call this uh, inter integral I. And then we can break this piece up. And I, I put two steps in one. And in retrospect, I wish I wouldn't have. But we can break this integral up to from A to X1, X1 to X2 to X2 to X3, all the way to, to, uh, to B. And so if, if you take this in here and look at that, that's what we do. We take the integrals from each of those uh, partition points and add them up. And then this minus this, we're adding zero. So it, it doesn't change the, the integral, but that's what we hear. So there's two steps in, in this one step. So now... We're going to arbitrarily call this I1 and I2. So let's look at I1 um, and we get this. So the absolute value of I1 is less than or equal to you know, the absolute value of you know, taking the uh, absolute values inside. Okay. But we said that since this is bounded by L, if we stick in L, we just made it much bigger. But then L doesn't live in the X world, so we can take it out, and that's what we get here. Now, here, now an integral is, it's kind of like, it. well, it is, it's area between these two curves. So if we look at the integral of, you know, in one partition point, so this, it, it actually, you know, as X, as X varies between here and here, the, this difference may grow big and then small. But if we stick in the biggest point and subtract off the smallest point, then this gets a little bit bigger. 
Okay, but we all since we're looking at aerial, so we need the the area of the x's and then the oscillation. So this becomes less than or equal to the sum of the oscillations times this delta x. And then since we picked a partition that made this really, really small, say less than uh, epsilon over L, we can put that there, and the L's cancel and we get epsilon. So this, this uh, integral I is actually so negligible, we'll just, we'll ignore it. And then next let's focus on the I2. So to develop some notation, we're going to let SI be this integral. So remember, we're looking at this I2. Um, so we want SI to be this integral here, which is this. Now, um, we can break this interval up from I minus 1 to A and A to XI. And that's what we do here. But this is flipped because of the negative. So if we put the negative back in there, it becomes a plus. But the reason we do this is the way we define the capital F is an integral from A to some value. It's this, basically. So we stick in Xi there. And then minus, you know, the integral from A to some X. Well, the, you know, it's Xi. So this is the way we define capital F on page 1. That you have, If you need to, go back and look. So this integral can be represented like this. Now, so I2 which is this. So this integral can be represented by SI and SI we said was the difference between these two functions. Now if we write this out, put stick in one, write out the terms, stick in two, write out the terms, stick in N, we get this. Now if we look at this sum, um, if there's only going to be one f of x0, and there's only going to be one f of xn. But the others, they're all, there's two of them. So we're going to regroup this based on f. And that's what this is. So we, there's going to be two f of x1s, and the g's will be grouped like this. And this actually goes all the way, except for the xn, there's only one of them, and there's only one f of x0. So now, but f of, you know, xn is what we call b, and x0 is what we call a. Now, remember, f, capital F, is the integral from a to x. So if we stick in a for x, it's the integral from a to a, which is 0. So this piece is 0 and drops out. Um, and then otherwise, and then we write this as in sigma notation. So this becomes this piece, because that drops out. Now, note that G is always positive, and it's monotonically decreasing. So for all X, it's, you know, it's positive. So this is positive. And since it's decreasing, this piece is positive. For all, you know, from I equals 1 to N minus 1. Also, F of XI is bounded by M. You know, it's integral and continuous, so it's bounded. So now, let's stick in. Um, so remember, this this is I2. Okay. So if we stick in the M here, we just made things get bigger. And so that's what we do here. And then, since M, there's no index, we can factor it out. But then, this becomes a telescoping sum. And so everything drops out but the last, well, except for the first piece, so the x0. So, you know, when we get to n minus 1, you know, that'll, the, that'll cancel with this, and this cancels with the previous term. So this, this ends up being m times g of x0. But x0 is what we were calling a. Okay. So we've just bounded i2 by capital M g of a. Now you can go through the same thing. So this f of xi is actually greater than or equal to little m. And then we can do this thing again and say that um, that we, we bounded i2 below by little m g of a. So similar argument here. So thus we have just showed that star 
holds and proven the theorem that 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 integral is bounded below by m of uh, g of a and bounded above by capital M g of a and since that is true then it implies that the, the that star is true which shows that the theorem is true so we're, we're done with that piece now the second part of this is we're going to switch the the g now f is in an integrable on a to b and let g be monotonically increasing and positive okay and it's actually this statement um, oh then there exists an e in this a b such that this is true and this is the the statement we that i stated without proof in the in the 12 video in the four year series um, so now let's prove this and it actually becomes very trivially true based upon part i so remember f is integrable so we're going to define a new f f tilde like this and g g is monotonically increasing so if we on a to b so if we define g tilde like this then g tilde is actually decreasing so f tilde is integrable uh, g tilde is decreasing and note that it's always positive on a to b so so f tilde and g tilde meet the requirement for part i so there's some e prime in this integral that this is true and this is this is part i of the of this video well let's write out what f tilde and g tilde are that's what this is now notice that um, that if we stick in a for g tilde so a here the a's cancel and we get b so it's actually this becomes g of b and then we stick in f tilde here now let's do a change of variable let t equal a b plus minus x take the derivative of both sides now plug those back into here we we don't touch this because it's not part of the integral and then it becomes this this becomes that now notice that it's b to a not a to b but that minus in the the delta t goes in and switches that the same way here this minus goes in and switches that and that becomes this and then this with those switched we're just going to call it for e to b where e is really a plus b minus this uh, e tilde well and this is what we wanted to show that there an exists in e such that that's true so the second part of this uh, video is also true well that's all i have for today hopefully you enjoyed it um please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one thanks bye